Our speaker tonight who's going to speak on renovation of uh, older equipment is, um, is our own member, uh, our, our own Gary Bush, who's too modest to tell you that he's a, he's a, a, a former university professor and a PhD, uh, uh, I like to call him doctor uh, because I try and get drugs and stuff off of him during lunch and during dinner. But uh, if you can uh, give it up for, uh, for Gary, uh, I'd appreciate it. You'll have a good time. This is going to be a good program. Don't stand under the speaker. Uh, we took care of instructions. <laughs> now can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was talk about, uh, well, go to the next slide because I think it starts right off of that. Oh, why? Go to the next one after that. <laughs> what will not be discussed tonight? Now, there's a difference between restoration and renovation. And the simplest way to explain the difference in the two in my mind, is think about a electrolytic capacitor. Am I doing this the way you want it? Pretty much. Pretty much. All right. Some guys will take an old radio, and there's an old one sitting right back yonder, right at the beginning, that you guys bid on. There's several electrolytic capacitors sticking up. If you're doing restoration, you take the capacitor out, core it out, put brand new components in it, then you put it all back together, glue it up, and nobody can tell there was ever anything done to it. That's restoration. I don't do that. Renovation is you tear that piece of junk out, throw it in the trash, and put in some caps at work with the idea of trying to get the rig back to the point where it worked like it did when it was new. But some of us aren't quite as much sticklers on it being looking like the absolute original parts. So I wanted to do that definition. So go back one. Thought you needed that point. Okay, why? Um, old tube area um, era gear. Uh, mostly you got to look at that in terms of the capacitors that are in it, resistors, uh, some of the transformers and the tubes. The tubes, I've had a lot of people ask, well, why do you use old gear? How do you ever get the tubes? I don't even make them anymore. Well, it turns out that ain't true. A lot of tubes are made, especially some of the uh, tubes that are of interest to the uh, stereo people who will pay insane prices. I may get this one wrong, but I think I have seen a 12 AT7, is that the right one? 12 go for, AX7. 12 AX7, go for well over 100 bucks because it was made in some weird factory in England or somewhere. I don't know what it was, but it made no sense <coughs> to me. But, but I typically pay 25 cents to two bucks for any tube I need, with the only exceptions being 6146. Everybody sells them cheap if you want to get them, but they usually don't work. Anyway, uh, the older gear is simpler to understand. The signals are larger cheap test gear, and they're usually a lot cheaper to buy. Uh, this Collins, and I know you guys can argue about this as to date, but somewhere in the late 60s anyway, might have been 70, but late 60s, KWM2A would go for 3,495 bucks. They're a little cheaper now. Anyway, <laughs> um, the modern gear has a lot of ASICs in it, so when one of the uh, application specific ICs goes, the Japanese typically make about 110% of what they're going to do for a production run. The extra 10% is some warranty repairs, and they keep a few around in case somebody buys them. That's precious few. If you wait a few years till something goes, odds are pretty good you won't get a replacement part. Now, I have seen people who do fix the more modern gear. The way they usually do it, at least the guys I know that I've talked to about, they'll buy four or five. Uh, dead rigs and then what they'll do is try to find enough parts to put together one that works out of four or five of them and they'll buy them cheap. They'll give you fifty seventy five dollars for a dead uh, something like a uh, TS 140 or something like that. Nothing really fancy. They give you a little money and then they hope they have not got one part bad the same part in every one of them. Uh, custom parts they can cost you. This KWM2 if you look at it later has one and only one nice big uh, capacitor. It's an electrolytic one in there that's got three sections in it. Where did it go? Oh, there it is. It's up under this knob. You'll see a knob on the top that's under it. There's a guy who sells it for, guess, I guess, about $50. 
for that one, and it's one that has been uh, cored out and the stuff, and it's been replaced, I think, or they had it remanufactured as a new one or something. But anyway, it's an expensive part. Uh oh. Now I'm back on. Okay, there is a button on the bottom. Uh, some of the modern gear, you have to be a, a double E and a communications engineer to really get the hang of how it works. A lot of the signals are small, the gear can be expensive. Um, fixing it by swap is almost the only way sometimes you can get it to work. This stuff ain't cheap, so those are all my prejudices. Go ahead. <laughs> now, safety. We ought to cover this one first. Uh, I know real men don't uh, wear no stinking safety glasses. You might ought to sometimes working with old gear. I had a guy who, uh, his dad passed away, a ham in California, had a 75A4 receiver, and he inherited it. He said, I can't wait to plug this thing and turn it on. I said, don't you dare do that. I pleaded with him, and I don't know if he's alive now or not, because he swore up and down, he was going to plug it in and see what happens. I tried to tell him, for gosh sake, don't do that. At the very least, bring it up nice and slow on a variac and see if you get any jumping current. If you don't, maybe you can play a little, but you're going to spend a day or two doing it, just bringing it up real slow to reform the caps. Otherwise, you better replace them. So, and if they blow up, I think you'll agree that can be a uh, very interesting and unpleasant experience. Um, but you got to keep in mind that all these things have uh, high voltage, up to 3,000 volts. If you get one that can have close to an amp at that, how many milliamps does it take if you get it right through your heart to clamp your heart? 30. That's about right. I've heard it 15, I've heard it 30. 30 is a good number. I'll go with, uh, with Jim on that. It's all it takes. It's not very much current. You just have to get it through your heart. And you can sure drive that with most of this gear. Uh, some people worry about lead. Some people worry about PCBs. Uh, transformers and capacitors that uh, have oil in them. The most common PCB one I know of, of course, is those old Heath kit uh, uh, and dummy, lo dummy loads, can tennis. It depends on them. Now, a lot of the guys did use some mineral oil stuff. That's fine. But if they just went to the local guys at uh, Georgia Power and said, y'all got any more of that oil I could put in here? It's a pretty good chance it's PCB. I just stay away from it. Although, although, there is, as far as I know, and if anybody here wants to contradict it, that's fine. As far as I know from what I have read, there has not been one, desert, one reported case of cancer from PCB. Now, there's a lot of dead rats out there that they messed with, <laughs> and they are sure it's going to happen, but they've never reported that I know of a single case of somebody dying from PCB exposure. And some of those guys at Georgia Power bathe in it, or used to. <laughs> Fire and explosion, old caps. Now, this is where I asked one guy to remind me. I am personally not a fan of NOS, new old stock. My view on that one is, what makes you think that's a bit better than one you're pulling out? You know it's dead, the one you just bought might be. They almost always say, new old stock, untested. Untested is a euphemism for pretty sure it don't work. So I'm not a big fan of new old stock. I know one guy had uh, capacitors for a heat kit power supply for the HWs and SBs for sale, and I looked at it in the eBay, and I thought, good land, he won like 30 or 40 bucks, and I bet you there wasn't one capacitor in there that would work. Then he naturally said, untested. Okay, there's also the mass. You drop it on your foot, those little bones are about 20, I think somebody told me it's 22 bones in your foot. That may be raw if it's an MD, I for, please forgive me. But uh, they're mighty tiny and easy to break. Um, Anyway, be a little careful with that. Also remember, you might get some contamination in a cut. If you haven't had a tetanus shot, you might want to think about that. You could cut yourself on some of this stuff. Uh, getting beat on prices. Always remember, eBay descriptions are all lies. I will stand by that. I haven't seen one yet where the guy told the total truth. If nothing else, he took the picture a little sideways so you didn't see the parts falling out. <laughs> Next. Oh, I'm sorry. What is the most critical possible thing to do this? If you guys will indulge me a second, can you bring the lights up? This will only be for a moment. We'll take them back down. The schematic. And I might point out, this is the schematic for the KWM2 up here. Nice and long. Got that little sucker. You can get it right off of uh, the internet. 
And to do this, all I did was put it on a USB key, take it down to what once was Kinko's is FedEx something or other. I don't know what the Samuel they call it. But for three or four dollars, they plug it in, they piddle with it, and five minutes later you got one of these, and by golly, you can read it. So, you know, if you have a regular small smack, don't tell me I can't get it and can't read it. If I can get one that's four feet, five inches long, then I know you can get one. And that's it. What they did was they just drew all the main lines down the middle and then just put everything where it needed to go. So anyway, that's an idea about schematics. Okay, so we can drop the lights again, we'll go on. Oh yeah, you where do I put it? Power, power, power battery. Do I need to turn the lights on again? <laughs> not yet, not yet. Okay. Uh, the very first thing, period, is the schematic. That is extremely important. Often, if you even say, oh, I can dope the certificate, uh, what the circuit is, but you can't dope out what the notes were that went with it. Sometimes the notes can be critical. Service manual, awesome. Uh, VT, VOM, VTVM, and DMM. It's actually nice to have all three. I like having a meter because if something's a little flaky, you'll see it with a meter, with a needle. But you're not going to see it on digital stuff because the digits will sit there and rotate. And you've got to ask yourself, are they flickering because it's telling you something or is it just a little beyond the measurement? The next thing is you need different types of soldering irons, even smaller ones than 25 watts sometimes, but usually 25 to 60 watts enough to do the job. You need cleaning supplies. It's nice to have a tube checker. I won't go into this extensively. The cheaper checkers, about all they do is they take all the elements, hook them to the cathode, then they've got the plate and they treat it like a diode. And the good or bad just means did it work as a diode to pass current and didn't blow up on you. That's kind of a flaky test. You'd like to at least have some possibility that is trying to measure transconductance. What I mean by that is the little test circuit's actually an honest to gosh little amplifier circuit, and they're actually trying to see if they can give you a number for that. Those it usually separates the tube checkers by about eighty or ninety dollars. Thirty to fifty dollars are probably your eighty, sixty, somewhere in there, probably just a diode test. And then if you go up from there, you can get one over 100, 125, 150. You start getting transconductance. Um, anyway, some small shop tools. A laundry sink is wonderful. And old handbooks and old magazines are amazing. Um, somebody, I don't know if they still sell it. I think it's actually on the Internet. You can get all the copies of Ham Radio Magazine. At one point, I got the whole Shimoli on a CD or DVD for 10 bucks. You can still get those, and until that guy went nuts with Heathkit, I have a CD that had almost everything on earth made by Heathkit. Schematics, manuals, all sorts of stuff. Again, on a CD. Paid well over $15 for that one. A friend of mine picked it up in California at a uh, swap meet out there. Okay. There's a website called The Wayback Machine. The Wayback Machine? Yes. Oh, I hadn't heard if that. If you search The Wayback Machine, it's the, it's, it's, it's the Internet Archive. Of Internet Archive. Internet Archive of? I believe it's archive.org. Everything. Org. everything. Every, including the Heathkit? It, it, it was up on the internet. There's a good okay. Snap. Please keep it quiet or the guy who owns the copyright will probably shut that one down. <laughs> Bama went down on that. They don't have them anymore. Okay. Another thing to keep in mind is, is it an antique or is it just old? That's a real problem that you see on Antique Roadshow. A person will come in with something that looks like a total piece of garbage and it's worth $32,000. Another guy, it's a beautiful piece of uh, furniture from the Revolutionary War and it's a copy made about five years ago and beat to death with a piece of chain. So it's hard to tell sometimes what is an antique and what's old. And you gotta kinda watch to find out which one's which. My personal opinion, Collins is way overpriced. Now, let me give you a simple example. Now, I don't remember the year, but somewhere in the 60s or 70s, the uh, Collins Radio Company, I know they went to the military with it, but they made so many KWM 2s and, two, and 2As that they could have taken, if they'd taken total production, every ham in the United States could have had one. That's how many they made. They made tens of thousands. It wasn't just they made 18 of them. They made them by the zillion. But a lot of them got destroyed. The military, in some cases, because, oh, that's, that's war material. And they'd run over, and can you believe it, with a uh, bulldozer. So there's not so many. Uh, anyway, wipe off with paper towels. That's a good thing. Uh, when you start off, first wipe it off, clean it up a little bit. 
Remove the knobs, the case, feet, speakers, meters, anything that is sensitive uh, to water, like paper, cloth, whatever. And be very careful about plugging up transformers and choke uh, holes with putty. My dad, I, I love my dad. He was the kind of guy that had trouble figuring out doorknobs. Fine man, but that was technology, it weren't his. Now, my dad one day saw me cleaning a power supply for an old piece of uh, national radio gear, an NCX3, not five, three, the power supply. And he saw I plugged everything up, cleaned it up, hosed, and I sprayed it down, hosed it. Dad got out three fans he had down in the basement, had a little dirt on them, put them out in the backyard and hosed them. Plugged them in, burned all three of them up. So think about that. <clears throat> there are different answers to how to do it. Now, I highly recommend when you clean stuff, do not use, what am I doing wrong here? Well, anyway, there we go. Do not use Fantastic. These may be old. Do not use 409. Uh, do not use anything that has phosphoric acid in the list of contents. It will etch aluminum, eat paint, and destroy decals. If you don't believe me, you just go right ahead and watch the value of what you got. Go straighten and forgive my children being in present and all that. It's going straight in the crapper. Don't do that. I have had no problem, though, with Simple Green. Simple Green does not have phosphoric acid in it. And while it tastes terrible and doesn't smell all that great, <laughs> theoretically it's not toxic. You could drink it. So at least there's that. Soft to stiff brushes. You need different things for cleaning soiled areas. Clean it. Clean it again, rinse it, clean it again. Use compressed air and use care with it to dry it, especially around variable capacitors. Don't go out here and blow air in it at 145 PSI. But, you know, nice and gently is a great way to get a lot of water off. And some of the older gear, the frames and everything are made of stainless steel. You really don't want to just wipe it off, let it sit till it's nice and dry and rusty. You don't really want to do that. Uh, but that's a good thing if you've got a... a some compressed air. Wash the knobs, I do it in a paper cup. Careful of the white mark uh, lines on there, although I have something to talk about with that tonight. Dry everything for a day or so no matter what. Some people uh, actually will put a rig in an oven, depending on how you value it and what's in it, and they'll let it bake at anywhere from, I've seen the low is 125 degrees, the high I've seen is 175. I don't really recommend that all that much. It's not that great to Combine stuff you may not know every component with with something you might be baking a cake in the next day and eating it. But people do that. And a few people actually keep an old stove they got for nothing, and they actually do bake them in their shops. They'll actually do that. Uh, repaint the case as needed if you need to. You can actually get custom spray paint cans, I've been told, at Home Depot if you've got something they can match it to. Uh, the other thing about that, though, is, oh, I should mention this. Most of what I'm telling you isn't simply what I figured out by myself. It's two different sources. One of them was, there was a company called Electronic Renovators. Anybody remember that name? They were down off of 14th Street in Atlanta, and they, re rent, they renovated Motorola two-way radios that went in cabs and all sorts of stuff like that. I went in their shop, and I nearly passed out the first time I saw them hosing down radio gear. But I learned a lot that afternoon. Next. Okay, this is just a picture of old capacitors. I have a fairly standard rule. If it's more than 25 years old or somewhere in that range, don't think about it. Replace it. You'll be glad you did. If nothing else, and it works fine today, well, how long do you think it's going to work? Well, a lot of those capacitors are well beyond their shop life or any other life. <laughs> just replace them. Don't go nutty. Now, one other funny thing. Most resistors become a little bit high. If they get more than about 20% off, in some cases less, especially power resistors, you ought to always take a look at them and replace them. Power resistors especially are uh, susceptible to uh, uh, being a problem in a radio. I would tell you something I read somewhere. Now, I've never tried this, but it was in a, a book I have on restoring antique radios. It suggested that a vast majority of those, if you, here again, will put it in an oven for about three hours at about a hundred and a half, that many of those resistors will come back to the right value if they're carbon. Now, I've never tried that, so I don't know if it works or not. I don't recommend it necessarily. 
I have a 1937 Philco that I listen to hate radio, that's WSB uh, on, that's what my wife calls it. She says every time I listen to it, I get in a bad mood. But anyway, it's a 1937 Philco with an eight or nine inch speaker. Oh, it comes through beautifully. But I did that. I replaced every resistor and capacitor in it, all of them, and it runs very nicely. Uh, okay, transformers. It's amazing how many times a transformer works. Just unless it's had some real abuse, something just shorted the tar out of it. A lot of times you'll get by with that, but it's good to sort of go slow with it. Bring it up to voltage a little bit, have it on a uh, meter, and just make with no load, just sort of being comfortable. You can bring it up. You don't see. If you've got a, a meter like I've got where you can measure the voltage you're coming up to and the current, if you don't start seeing it popping up like that on the current, you're probably okay. If you can get it up to full voltage, that's good. Now, it's still not the same as it under load, but that's pretty good indication you may going to be able to get home with it. Uh, tubes, check the transconduction or at least emission if you can. They're often good. I'm surprised how seldom do I find the tubes are the thing that's wrecking performance or something. The other thing, too, is there's only one real test other than if the tubes, you know, got a you know, if it's, got, if it's cold and the filament's uh, open or something, I mean, that's pretty definitive. But most of the time, what's the only test that really matters with a vacuum tube? Swap it. Yes, sir, dead on the money. Uh, just because it doesn't have the transconduction or whatever, that doesn't mean it's not going to work in that circuit. The only ironclad test is you substitute uh, another tube, and if it doesn't change, then I don't care what the readings are, it's good. Next, a few uh, chemicals. Safety. It's good to use a ventilated area. If you, if you don't have a hood, do it outside. Uh, that's what I do. I do it out in the backyard. Uh, solder flux, you can remove that with spray and a brush, and you can see a flux remover. Uh, these were all bought at your local emporium over at Fry's. Uh, it's good to use contact cleaner is a good thing. Do not try to get wa rid of water with water displacing formula number 40. I had a guy who did that. He dropped a radio in the ocean, pulled it out, dried it out, sprayed it down with WD-40, said, hot dang, we're ready to go, and burned out everything in sight. <laughs> Don't do that. WD-40 is not a what? It's not a lubricant. Everybody thinks it's a lubricant. It is not a lubricant. It's a water displacer. It's just what WD stands for, water displacement. If you want to lubricate something, either use the contact cleaner or a little judicious small amount of oil or something like that. But don't just spray things down. Oh, I'll put WD-40 in. Well, I know it'll go nice and smooth for a little bit, but that's not a long-term answer. Uh, intermittents and drifts and stuff like that. Sometimes you can use uh, circuit freezing material like that. You can spray it and cool something down. It'll come back. And that usually is if something works okay, but after a short period of time it quits working. It could well be a possibility of a component that is opening up as it gets warm. Uh, especially sensitive to that are things like, believe it or not, coils. Sometimes you'll have a, uh, a solder joint that's really old, like by 1937 Philco, and uh, the wire will just barely be touching. When you first turn it on, it works. As it warms up, it expands a little, and you lose it. That also happens with resistors. They tend to crack and stuff like that inside. Just because a part looks good on the outside, does that mean it's good on the inside? Uh-uh. No. Can't depend. Oh, go back one more time. If you're going to buy something, get the Deox, because some of the stuff in that is very expensive. It's like $15, $20 for this little spray can works like crazy but uh some of the chemicals in it are fairly stiff first a use it outside but number two i can't wait to see how long before the epa finds that they've got deox out there and pulls it off the market i keep figuring every time i go to fries they won't have it again but so far they're still selling deox next i'm sorry i should point components um the so-called myth of the good electrolytic First off, uh, I, as I told you about my feeling about no uh, about new old stock, I don't care how they look. They often you just got to bite the bullet and replace them. The reason I say bite the bullet is some of those little orange drop capacitors look great, but they're still bad. Selenium rectifiers, you want to get rid of those. The only problem with that is when you replace one of those little son of a guns with a diode, you often need to measure. If hopefully it works when you got it, because you need to replace it. 
but you need to figure out what the voltage was that it was trying to supply. And usually the replacement for that little part there is a real resistor or transistor, or I'll get in a minute, diode. A 1N1007 is a great choice in almost 99% of the cases. 1,000 volt PIV 1 amp. But you might need a resistor in series uh, with it to get it to uh, uh, come out with the same voltage you start with. Now and then in older radios, you'll find a plastic block like this. This one's probably phenolic. That one actually came out on a 1937 Philco. Don't know why they bothered, but that's three capacitors in there, and it just had a it bolted in, and I don't know, they just did that. You've seen some of the later ones where they have a little ceramic-y looking package with 10 or 12 wires coming out. I always worry about one of those going, because what a pest. You have to replace a bunch of parts. Uh, rubber parts, grommets, stuff like that. Watch out for old wire. Uh, people pay extra for KWM2s and KWM2As that have uh, Teflon wire. And that's kind of nice, but you don't always find that. The older radios, the stuff does crack. Antique radio supply, you can get all the wire that looks just like it did in 1937. However, it ain't cheap. Nothing at antique radio is cheap. Yes? Uh, Mac replaced the selenium with a diode, and it jumps his uh, voltage up from 900 to 1100. They burn out his 1,000 volt maximum flute voltage. Well, Ooh. that can happen. That's why I was saying you need to go back and look to see what voltage you're supposed to get, yeah, did, but and then do he, the calculations. He did that, but then he went right. He, he went. He went on the older one nine, and saw 900 volts. So the new one, he went and see, put his voltmeter on, but he didn't have a high voltage probe on it, and um, burned it out. There you go. A war story from the field. Ouch. But he's right. It was, uh, to me, yeah. I think first thing I think is you got to do a little calculation, figure out, put that resistor in first before you. Just put the dogs in and see what happens. You don't want to go there. And, and it was not a cheap repair job. No, I bet it wasn't. Looks okay. Cheap. This is this is a um, uh, old transmitter. Does anybody? And this one's after I cleaned it up. Uh, it cleaned up. I think it looked as new as can be. You can see at the top some of the paint wasn't so good. Uh, can anybody look at that and guess what it was? <laughs> Johnson. Yes, Johnson Adventurer, I guess it is. Exactly. Man, you've been around a while. <laughs> anyway, what did I do with that? Power cord was two wires. There's where you get into renovation versus restoration. Restoration, you got to go with the old two wire. Renovation, you put the three wire in and you ground the chassis on it or chassis, as some people call it. Uh, I always like the idea of just go ahead and bite the bullet, even if you just solder it in somewhere, put a fuse in it. I mean, you know, don't... I, we burned up something in California. I have a, a lab out there that's a secure lab, and uh, Dr. Jones and I were going to try out about a 25-year-old BH looper. Turned it on, got a display on the screen. Oh, this looks pretty good, and we were working on the knobs and all. Hey, don't you smell some? Uh, oh, I think I do. Ooh, open the door and smoke was pouring out of that thing. It was, we almost were afraid it was, well, I was. I was afraid it was going to hit the sprinklers, flood a brand new lab, and I'd be fired. So we wheeled it out of the room and let it smoke out into the uh, hallway. But it uh, was a tra power transformer. Power transformers will oftentimes heat up like crazy internally, and by the time they start smoking, not only are they destroyed, but it may smoke a while. That thing was a good 10, 15 minutes before it quit smoking. So you got to watch out. I personally love to replace SO239 uh, RCA phono plugs. I know this is rhetorical with a group like this, but what is the output connector on a KWM2 or 2A? RCA. RCA. And is it easily replaced? No. No. They put rivets in the stinking thing. And worse, they used a short RCA so that it isn't even a great connection to a good R. You can get a fancy RCA mail plug, you're still not home. Why did they do that? I don't know the answer, but I'm sure somebody does. But I can tell you one bizarre thing. If you go through uh, and use a network analyzer, measure impedances all the way through the circuit, turns out the old dumb RCA does not produce a bump in impedance. It turns out that's pretty close to a 50 ohm connector. Isn't that weird? Okay, clean check, uh, clean it and check the resistors and all that. This was a miracle. A guy just gave it to me. I don't know why, but when I go to swap meets in California, there's almost always somebody just looks at me for a second, cranks his head sideways and says, 
I need to give you something. It hands me things. A guy handed me this very act from HP, and it's fully functional. AC voltage all the way up, and uh, amps up to two amps on the scale. You plug it in, you crank the knob, and you're ready to roll. That is a wonderful box for old gear like that, because you can see what the current is, what the voltage is, and you can sit there, and if that needle on the current side starts wobbling, it's time to stop. You need to go take a look at what you're doing. It's a wonderful thing, but you can bring it up slow if you do it. Uh, bring it up maybe 20, 30 volts, watch the current, give it a few hours. Then try 50, 70, 90, 100, 110. Bring it up slow and watch the current. Especially also if it's a receiver, you can listen for hum and get a better idea if the power supply is pretty much shot. Yes? I did not. I just got the issue and I just flew back from California and I hadn't had a chance to look. Oh, look for that. Oh, very much so. John's pointing out you can get the series resistance on a cap with a little meter described in the latest issue of QST. That would be handy to look at the caps. If the resistance is very, very high to begin with, then you probably could got a good chance you might could run it if it isn't shorted. Anyway, old test gear is often tube type gear. And a lot of times old tube gear is good for checking out old tube gear. <laughs> so this is an old night kit signal tracer. It will let you test the speaker and the output end of a receiver. It's got 110 volts and silly as it may sound, you can actually use this in a winking eye tube and measure the <laughs> power consumption of a small radio. It's got an audio generator in it. It also has a uh, uh, audio amplifier, and, uh, and you can apply your own input to it if you want to do that. It's kind of cute, all the little things it's got. So you can test a lot of things out with that. The best of all worlds, if it's Heathkit, try to get the original Heathkit assembly manual. Why? Because there's sometimes you'll look at it and wonder, how in the Sam Hill did they put that together? The manual will have it in there, and that's way cool. Uh, they also have the large circuit diagrams that fold out, and where can you get those puppies copied? Kinkos. Kinkos, or FedEx, or whatever they call it. Even really big ones, three or four feet by three or four feet, they can do it. It's really cool, and they can make it whatever size you want. Uh, also, you can look on the internet, get updated modification lists, old articles out of Hints and Nicks. Anybody remember that little booklet? That they still publish it. If you look back and find, I, I wonder, our good old Narfal Library ought to have a collection of those bad boys. And you can look in there and sometimes find interesting modifications that improve or fix problems with older gear. The uh, other thing is re-kitting. Re-kitting is something I haven't done, but I've been told it's not as hard as it first looks. If I were to re-kit something like the uh, SB-102, what you do is you don't go crazy but you totally disassemble it, but not totally. What I mean by that is only an idiot would take the wiring harness apart. You could, I mean, that'd be pretty stupid. But you would take all the parts off the PC boards, take the PC boards out and clean them. Here's a little pet project if anybody wants to go wacko. I love the SB-102. It was actually pretty much designed by old Collins engineers. I talked to uh, some people from Collins, and they said, yeah, that's not a myth. Uh, Collins decided to get out of uh, ham radio. That was before Rockwell and the 380. And uh, some of the engineers that had designed the KWM series came over and worked on the designs for the uh, HW and SB series. So you can see some similarities in how they look and how they were designed. It wasn't simply a pure attempt at a Japanese copy. The engineers were, they were actually common engineers between them. Now, having said all that, the biggest uh, flaw with the SB-102 is what? VFO. No, the VFO is cheap enough to get, but you can't repair it. It was built by TRW. It's solid state, and it was laser trimmed at that time, which was a real feat way back then to get it to be extremely stable. But you're right, you can't fix it. The biggest problem or flaw with the SB-102 to keep it running, and all the SW and HW series, is 
They built the blame things on mud boards. That's what we called them in California. You probably call them phenolic out here. But eventually they will deteriorate and become a giant carbon resistor. Not the best thing to build your circuits on, but Jamie, I think his name is Jamie Farr, at Farr Circuits, I called him one day, and he said, if you can get me a bare board, which you might do if you were re-kidding by taking everything off, or a good picture of exactly, it doesn't have to be the right size, it's got to be all things in the right place, he can resize it. He, I don't know how much he charged, but he will make beautiful glass epoxy boards to go in there. And then that SB-102 is going to last you for a good while. Next, there's a, a rig, wow! But gear that's cosmetically great is a joy, usually. That SB-104 was a pain in the katukas. Yeah, it was the last time Heathkit tried to build a big time transceiver as a kit. And I believe somebody at Heathkit once said, now I'm not sure this is actually literally true, but somebody swore that there wasn't one of those that a ham completed that didn't have to go back to the factory for something. They were just, and the next rig they came out with was basically bought from, I think it was Yesu. And uh, which one was it, sir? 757. Well, anyway, there you go. But I found the thing a real pain trying to figure out how to get it all to work. And I finally just said, add the Dickens with it. It doesn't have any tubes in it. I figure that thermionics will eventually rule the world. No doubt of that. Don't believe it, ask Putin. And then the solid state stuff's kind of a fad. So I ended up saying, it ain't worth the trouble. Resources, data on the web, AWRL, QST, there are PD, uh, PDFs around, ham radios on a uh, CD, Bama, old hints and next books, Google, uh, handbooks, um, whatever you can find, old AWRL, AWRL handbooks are good. Uh, Fry's Electronics has a lot of stuff. People may not remember this, but ACK Radio still exists. And sometimes they're the right place to go. Radio Shack almost doesn't exist anymore. And the parts, yeah, well, you can decide that for yourself. You can get a QST, but then again, by mail order, but you can also get it on the web. As you know, every issue, I believe, am I right? Every issue is on the web if you're a member. So that's kind of a cool reference. Uh, Mauser is, uh, Jayco's good, DigiKey is good, but Mauser is almost exhaustive. And DigiKey, though, is extremely good, and they have no minimum order. It's already been by a couple times. Uh, this was uh, the 640 from the last time I did a presentation. I chose not to bring it because I had to disconnect everything, but it looked pretty dirty and all that. Next one. That's another picture of it, a lot of dirt and all that. Cleaned up beautifully. Just a fine, fine piece of gear. That is the remote VFO for the SB series from Heathkit. Cleaned up like a champ, works like crazy. Really like that. And it uh, looked pretty dirty though when I got it. Next. Bought this recently at the Orlando Ham Fest. Some of you went down there to what we now call finally the Mud Fest. It rained the whole time and the flea market was a washout pretty much, I thought. I didn't get this cleaned up as well as I'd like, but by any means, but that's how it looked when I got it. Paid pretty high for it. I paid two dollars for that. Wow. Next. And it cleaned up, looked about like that. That's one end of it. Next. And you can see I took it apart. Biggest problem I had, I think I can clean this off. There are two or three ways to try to get that meter face to clear up, just like the headlights on your car. The first thing to try is uh, mild toothpaste. I've been told that works pretty well. Of course. Is, what do you recommend, Jim? Pumice. Pumice is less a problem than mild toothpaste? We need to talk. <laughs> anyway, um, don't know what to do about this. I don't think the original color was sort of that. So, But the colors under here were beautiful. They were in great shape. Now, I think the next set of slides, and maybe one, yeah, there's what it looked like on the inside after I'd cleaned it up and all the rest and washed it with a little care. So what are the two parts right off the bat that you did sure want to lose? The caps. And that's a little selenium rectifier it needs to go in the trash. So I got rid of those guys. Also, I did mod it slightly here. The original design, you turned it on, it was at max gain, then you went down. Everybody wanted it really to go the other way, so you need to just flip the connections on the uh, pot. I did that. Next. Now, if you read Cal the Collins Collectors Association Journal, there's, I think it's called The Signal, 
In there, they will tell you to be extremely careful in washing the knobs because you can't do anything about the paint in the little slots on the knobs and stuff like that. Au contraire, the, you can. And what I'm going to show you is this is one knob that is on this, the left knob that's on this Heathkit, Heathkit uh, bridge. Next, that was the right knob. Some dimwit washed the thing a little aggressively and all the paint came right off of those little recesses. Pretty much, yeah, the outside ring. Washed it and ruined it. Next, that's what it looked like when I was done. I didn't get this slide into the slideshow, so I'm going to put it up here. There's essentially a heavy, pasty white paint that comes in a tube, and you squirt this stuff, or not really, it's, it's like a very thick paste. You rub it across on there, it goes into the grooves, and then you take a, uh, a nice soft cloth, and gently, don't go nuts on me here, and you wipe it off, and it'll come completely off and do nothing but fill the spots in. There's one other trick to it, though. Don't touch it for 24 to 48 hours. That's a heavy, thick paste. It needs to dry. That's why you see it in a plastic container here, so it won't dry out on me. You got to give it a couple of days to dry before you touch it. Just do the job. Ooh, that look good. And then go do something else for a couple of days. What's it called? White out. No, it's not called white out. No, white out won't do it. White out will not come out the same as this at all. This stuff's about 20 times better than using whiteout. Whiteout may stick to the rest of it. I don't recommend, now, sorry, but I don't recommend that. This stuff's about five bucks from Amazon and it works like crazy. What's it called? Well I, it, well, I can't read it up here, but it'll be up here. Just come up and look for it. And don't steal it. But it'll be right here. No, read we're not, it, Gary. Huh? Read it. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I gotta get my glasses out. Lord help, nothing's easy in this club. Pay for getting a free dinner. It's called lacquer stick. Lacquer stick. You can come up here and write it down if you want to. It's called fill-in paint, and it's this is paper, and then this stuff sticks out like a piece of chalk. It's very thick. It's heavy stuff. And when you put it on, it'll do it. Now turn the lights, turn the lights back off. That was what the KWM2 symbols looked like. Oh, oh, that KWM2 probably wouldn't go for 50 bucks, looking as bad as that. And if you read the CCA man, or signal, it'll say, well, that's just a lost cause. They're dead wrong. Next. That's what it looked like after I used this stuff. And those of you who think that's trick photography, I brought the little puppy for you to look at. So it's sitting right here. So that's what you can do to make that thing look right on your KWM2. Now, next one. Now this is a trick and a half. Found this on the CCA site. Hot diggity dang. How many of you boys out there have a piece of plastic that has gone brown on you or yellowy brown? That's because, you remember in the early days they did pictures on acetate? Well, now and then they'd have a big fire out in California and Hollywood and burn up billions of dollars worth of wonderful old films. So they changed the composition and all that. When they went to plastics, as you remember the first X years with the KWMs, and I'm sure Jim could tell me the year they quit, they went from using an aluminum ring on the front to a plastic ring. The plastic rings do that. Why? Bromine. That's what they put in to make it a bit of a fire retardant. Don't know why anybody was worried about a KWM2 catching on fire and burning the place down, but they did. How do you fix it? There's a paste that some people that were in the computer business came up with, and somebody that was head of Collins read it, published an article on it, and there's some nasty, nasty stuff that you can use, put it as a paste on here, cover, the pa cover it up in paste, then you cover it with saran wrappers, the saran wrap, yeah, something like that, so the moisture doesn't come out, so it stays pasty and wet for about 24 to 48 hours, and it will leach the first two to 5,000 angstroms of the plastic of bromine, and you'll get what you get in the bottom, which is worth another, what, Jim, two, three hundred dollars on the price of that KW? That thing looks brand new. Woo, that thing looks good. I started to bring an old HP scope I've got, hoping you guys would give me 25 bucks for it, but I doubt if I could have gotten that much. Exactly this has happened. The plastic looks terrible. And you've seen this where you had something laying on something and then you take it off later. Oh my gosh. 
the plastic under it doesn't look too bad. The rest of it's all this yellowy, browny, yucky poo. Now, next one. So, what's the paste? Oh, this stuff ain't good. Use a pint of hydrogen peroxide, two heaping tablespoons of xanthan gum, Lord knows what that is, some glycerin, some oxy detergent, some hot water, and you need to go to Home Depot and use a black light. You need a UV light to activate the mess. And you need to use gloves and all of that to do it. You don't really want this stuff all over yourself. A pain in the katusi, but nevertheless, it's the only thing I've ever seen that works. Now, where do you find out more about this? Next. There's the website. Now, am I right, Walt, that you're going to put the presentation on the web somewhere with this club? It can be done if you want it. It doesn't matter to me. You can put it there if you want it, especially if you don't want to hear me do this again. <laughs> you can either write that down you can send uh, an email somewhere, or if it's on the website, there it is. Or if you can't find it, period. Oh, I'm not going to do any of that. Look up Collins Collectors Association, The Signal. Put all that in the search for Google. It'll pop up a page that has uh, about, oh, 10 or 12 years of The Signal. If you can remember this, go to the second from the last issue on the website. Don't ask me the date. Second from the last. You'll find the whole article, including the website, where the computer geeky poos came up with this approach. Next, I'm sorry, I'm so disappointed. That means we're done. Thank you for your time. I think I finished in less than two hours. I go to an auto parts store and ask them about something that gets rust off and get something you can spray or do something with. But the amount of changing capacitance and the effect on the operation should be pretty much nothing. But it'll look terrible. The other one I didn't mention is the same exact thing. My 1937 Philco had a chassis made of what? Now remember, this is depression. What did they make it? Well, tin's expensive. What was the cheapest thing you could buy in 1937? And it's true today. Steel. So it's got some rust on it and some corrosion. And about all you can do is you go to the auto parts store and say, I've got some rusty uh, steel, and you can clean it. There's also that stuff that cleans silver, whatever that stuff is. Tarnex. But here is your problem. <laughs> Elbow grease. You're just going to have to work the dickens out of it, and you can finally get the don't break down the sand. That's not a good idea. But if you work at it, you can get a lot of it off. Did that help any? Yeah. Don't don't worry about the. Uh, it's just the way it looks, and then as long as it isn't shortened out, I will stand on my background and tell you I don't think it makes any serious effect. Not on operation. Any other questions about this? Yes, sir. Uh, just a comment. If you're restoring the Collins equipment. It's good, it's good. Just uh, there's a, a guy, I think it's, his call is K3ICH, but you can find him uh, by just doing a search on the Collars Collectors Association. He's on their website, but he makes the aluminum inserts for the knobs. They're on eBay. Are they on eBay too? 20 bucks for a stick of you sitting aluminum. Well, <laughs> well, but it... They fit perfect. And if you don't do that, you're talking a hundred, two hundred dollars difference. Because they charge 20 stinking bucks for the rubber feet. You can buy them at Fry's. 20 something bucks people want for the feet. I saw a guy for 12 or $14 sells you the, six, the five screws you need on the bottom to hold the feet on because Art Collins kissed them. 
I'm sorry. Don't get mad at me, Jim. <laughs> oh, I had one question. Let me take less than a minute and a half to ask this. I have one problem I'd like to use this learned crowd to help me. Dr. Bush doesn't for sure know the answer to this, and he'd like to ask your help. Well, this KWM2, every band works just fine, no problems at all. 40 meters, turn the receiver on, beautiful. Boy, Collins filter, man, you are cooking with gas. But, you tune the VFO, slides across the band, everything's perfect. Except if anybody is transmitting CW or whatever on 7064, 7.064. I don't care where you go in the band, you're going to hear him right there in the background. I haven't got a clue how. I, I even took the 40 meter uh, crystals out, both of them. I know, yeah, it was the other crystal. No, it wasn't. Took them both out. It's still 7.064. If nobody's there, it's totally perfect. When I sell it, I'm going to make sure there's nobody on that frequency at the time. <laughs> but if anybody has an idea, I'd entertain knowing about it. I'm done. That was it. I just wanted to ask that one question. Thank you. Thank you. Let me get you